Thanks very much. Um, I say short paper, we're running behind and I've got a very full 40 minutes here. So I'm going to crash through stuff as quickly as I can. Um, I'm going to tell you what unmannedspaceflight.com is, what it, what it does, what it's about, and I think you'll agree there's probably some pretty, pretty significant overlaps in the abilities, the knowledge base, the enthusiasm, and the outreach of people like the members of unmannedspaceflight.com and AMSAT UK, um, a community that I wasn't a member of 24 hours ago and consider myself a part of now. This is the website. Some of you may or may not have, you know, may have seen this. Um, what it is is a normal forum. You don't have to register to view it, but you do have to register to contribute. And it discusses most of the unmanned spacecraft that are out there exploring the solar system. Now, it's not a tirade against manned spaceflight. I'm a big fan of manned spaceflight. It's just an appropriate title to talk about the Mars Exploration Rovers, Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, Cassini, New Horizons, all these missions that are out there exploring the solar system. And the important thing being taking pictures and sending them back to the, to the, to the, wor the world and chucking them on the web so that enthusiastic amateurs can have a look at these pictures and do something interesting with them. The website's been going about five years. June, last full month, about 28,000 unique visitors, but only 2,000 members, of which about one in 100 are kind of really significant contributors. So we have an epic lurk to contribution ratio, which probably says something about the quality of the stuff that people are coming up with. This line at the bottom here, as someone classified me as the self-appointed dictator for life of unmanned spaceflight.com, which to save time, I'll let us call UMSF. And it's, it's, it's a half truth. Um, I have great help from a team of admins who are far more grown up and sensible than I am, and who fortunately kind of cover the globe in a forum administration DSM kind of, kind of way. If you think of kind of Mars or spacecraft and forum and internet, you immediately think of crazy, kooky, Sionia, anomalistic rubbish. And there are very few places where you can go to talk about the real stuff going on without that getting in the way. So if you come to this forum and say, I've, this is, here's a picture, I think this is a skull on the surface of Mars, we will delete your post, delete your account, and ban your IP address. Because this is not the forum for you. Go somewhere else. But as a result of that, because people know that rule's in place, we just don't get that stuff arriving. We actually very rarely have to do that sort of administration. And because of the environment it produces, we have rover drivers. We have scientists from New Horizons. We have scientists from uh, Cassini. We have engineers from ESA, all visiting and contributing on a regular basis which is a pretty unique state of affairs, I think you'd agree. It started back in the beginning of 2004 when Spirit and Opportunity landed on the surface of Mars and Steve Squires, the principal investigator, and Jim Bell, the head of the PanCam color camera on these rovers, agreed to put every single image taken by these two rovers, more than a quarter of a million to date, online the moment they could get them. So at the JPL website, you'll get thumbnails like this. If you go to a website called the Exploratorium, it's an educational museum based out of San Francisco. You get directory listings like this. These file names actually mean something. They can tell you about when the image was taken, what rover took it, which camera, etc., etc. And I couldn't help myself because I'm a bit of a Photoshop weenie. I love this sort of stuff. So I was thinking, well, here's, you know, here's three images that make a color sequence, red, green, blue, Photoshop, color picture. Here's a whole string of these things, I'm putting mosaics together. And I started this forum to share that sort of creativity. And very, very quickly, I found that other people were far better at doing this than I was, and I started producing mosaics like this. Now, it's worth noting that the imagery that goes online is uncalibrated, and it's heavily stretched, and it's heavily compressed. So there's two rows of images here. I'll tell you that if you just saw the top line and then the bottom line of images that made this mosaic, they don't match. It's a lot of work, a lot of creativity to get these images to match and produce one continuous mosaic like this. This is another one. Uh, the color's not quite right here. Somehow the projector's making things slightly green. This is by a guy called James Canvin. He works uh, down at the Met Office down in, uh, in Devon, I believe. And again, this is from raw, uncalibrated, stretched JPEGs. He's written his own software that turns these things into RGB and then calibrates them all together to get one continuous mosaic. You don't have to be particularly scientific about this. This is an image that was never ever taken, essentially. It's a series of wide angle black and white frames that were done as a cloud observation and they stitched together quite well. And another series of black and white frames that we're looking at the terrain below. And using a piece of software I'll show you in a minute called Midnight Mars Browser, we know how these two sets of images relate to one another. And so someone put them together as a single mosaic. Somebody else thought, that's nice. I'll colorize it using the color data we've got from PanCam. Someone else thought, that's nice. I'll fill in the gap. And then we've got one gorgeous picture that shows the clouds, the horizon, and the terrain. And this image has made it to Astronomy Picture of the Day and various other places. 
sense of scale can be pretty difficult to gauge if you're looking at pictures from another planet. And so one guy in the forum has a penchant for giving these people a kind of a third-person perspective. So here is an artist's impression of Opportunity sat in a picture taken by Opportunity studying its own heat shield. Six months after images are taken, in three months chunks in arrears, uh, the science teams chuck all their calibrated data onto the PDS, the Planetary Data Service. It's epic quantities of calibrated data. These data sets are absolutely huge. One guy, Dan Crotty, a programmer from San Francisco, has made his job that every time this new release happens, he downloads every single piece of data. And in every single kind of red, green, blue, or near-infrared, green, blue, near-ultraviolet, all these various filters that are used by PanCam, he produces his best effort of a real color picture, a true color image. And he hasn't done this once or twice. He's done this 16,000 times so that every single color observation by Spirit and Opportunity are on there on his website. And they all mosaic perfectly now. Not the stretch JPEGs that go on the web immediately, but because these are calibrated images, they mosaic together absolutely perfectly. One exercise he did was to take the northern rim of Victoria Crater. This is an 800 meter wide crater that Opportunity spent two years to get to and a year exploring the northern rim. Every marker point you see here is another large postcard, typically four or five frames across, two frames tall, perhaps eight to 15 megapixels of imagery. And he's made the calibrated mosaics for every single one. So on his website, you can roll over these points, and as you roll over, you get the calibrated mosaic, the location it was taken from, and the field of view. It's a fantastic way of seeing all these capes and bays of rocks jutting out from this northern rim of this rather large crater. Dan's also has a, a great way of looking for movies. The rovers don't have movie cameras, they just take still pictures. But if you look at one spot on Mars long enough, something will happen. A lot of it is dust devils. There are huge quantities of dust devils at Gusev Crater right now. In fact, there are huge quantities of dust devils at Gusev Crater every Martian summer. But this is actually looking at a dune field that's about half a kilometer away. And you may just be able to see it. Over a period of a couple of months, dust devils have come through and left streaks behind. I'll load it again so you can see it. You can see the dust streaks. The rover has moved in this period ever so slightly, but it's calibrated together, all the pointing towards this El Dorado dune field absolutely exactly. And so the scientists and engineers have actually been sequencing more images of this dune field over the past three years nearly to see the evolution of the dune field and the dust devil streaks that get left behind. It's not just pictures from the ground, it's pictures from orbit as well. High rise is the high resolution uh, imaging science experiment. It's a 25 centimeter per pixel camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And as it flies overhead, it might take a 25 centimeter pixel of a particular crater. And then in another orbit at another time, they'll fly back over the same place. And by looking across at that crater, they'll have stereo interpolation and be able to produce an elevation model of that piece of ground. The US Geological Survey, led by Randy Kirk, released that elevation data onto the web. So using my kind of multimedia production hat, my day job hat, I figured out how to get that into an animation package and produced this, uh, this animation of a crater somewhere on Mars. I don't know where it is but it includes uh, some of these streaks you may have heard about in crater walls that they're thinking of perhaps are kind of Olympic swimming pool sized chunks of water suddenly gushing out into the soil. And there are more of these. There's one done of the whole, the whole of the Columbia Hills where Spirit has been driving for five years and I showed it to one of the rover drivers and he almost burst into tears. Not just pretty pictures from the ground, not just pretty pictures from orbit, nothing better than the night with Excel. This is a guy who's taken the estimated atmospheric capacity, the estimated dust loading on the solar panels, the seasonal uh, trends on Mars, and calculated how much power from direct sunlight and kind of diffuse sunlight that the rover's going to get over a period of time, and forecasted that forwards based on atmospheric capacity in the past, duplicating season after season. And here's the total power that uh, sorry, Spirit would have had, and you can see the seasonal trend here from its first summer, its first winter, its second summer, where it got cleaned significantly. These jumps are cleaning events. And then kind of the third Martian summer getting stolen by some really pretty epic dust storms. But this data ties in exceptionally well and is kind of useful to give us an idea of how well one of these rovers is going to do in the future. One guy has produced a whole bunch of web pages. There's a list of them at the bottom here, Rosetta, Messenger, New Horizons, and they're essentially calendars. They tell you what these spacecraft are doing, what time it is for that spacecraft. So I've grabbed a piece of it and it's now on my dashboard on my Mac. I can see exactly what day it is for Spirit, what day it is for Opportunity, what local time it is. And I know that if it's getting to some 8, 9, 10 o'clock in the evening local time for one of the rovers, it's time for me to start checking the JPL website to see if there are any new pictures to, to enjoy. 
And he's done the same thing for various spacecraft, and especially if there are pretty unique events like the Phoenix landing. During the Phoenix landing, he actually had a website that was counting off all the critical events. How long till the parachute deploys? How long till the heat shield's thrown away? How long till the thing lands? All counting down in real time. Another chap took the Phoenix entry, descent, and landing data, which was uh, a spice kernel, essentially, but with some accelerometer data added in, and turned the whole thing through Povray into an actual, accurate, animated it's kind of telling of what Phoenix did during its final 40 cent landing on the surface of Mars. This is accurate. And not only is it accurate, if you now go back and listen to the audio for Mission Control at the time it landed, you can play that at the same time, and you get to see what they couldn't. They were just guessing in the blind from data, and you can see he's saying, you know, gravity turn detected, and you can see the spacecraft, suddenly the, the spacecraft starts rotating. And touchdown happening exactly on time. I beg and beg this guy could, to go and do the same thing for Spirit and Opportunity, because they didn't land like this. They landed surrounded by airbags and bounced and bounced and bounced across the surface, and the same principle would work. The Beagle 2 viewing guide. This is um, kind of slightly sick in some ways. It's high rise now being uh, taking amazing pictures of the surface of Mars at 25 centimeters per pixel. The question is can it find any impact debris or wreckage of the Beagle 2 lander? And I wanted to figure out just how good high rise would be at seeing human detritus sat on the surface of Mars. So I found some little 3D models of various spacecraft and emulated the resolution that high rise got at kind of 2, 3 o'clock local time, which is what the lighting conditions are when high rise sees something. And so here is a, my guesstimate of what the Mars Pathfinder lander would have looked like. This is what the Sojourner rover would look like, which is actually this size. And this is my estimation of what a Mars exploration rover would look like. And to give you a sense of scale, the rover's camera mast stands about this high and the mast itself is about this wide. Now, I did these before high rise got to Mars, and these are the pictures it's since taken. Here's the Pathfinder lander. Here's the uh, here's, uh, opportunity, actually, sat on the rim of uh, Victoria Crater. And people were like, wow, we can see the shadow of the camera mast. And I'd forgotten that some time previously I'd figured out we probably would anyway. <laughs> At the end of the, um, frankly, tragic reading of the Beagle 2 accident investigation report, there is a chapter that discusses the estimated impact crater of what might have happened if the thing had just augured straight in without doing anything. If you go looking for it, it should be this big. Backseat driving. Um, you may have read, if you follow these two rovers, that Opportunity has recently set out from Victoria Crater on another two plus year, 15 kilometer journey to an even larger crater that's to the southeast of where it currently is. And whilst the rover driving team can't say, help us figure out the safe way to go, they may have said, you know, how navigable do you think this terrain is based on high rise pictures? And so people have used Photoshop or GIMP or their own image processing software they've written themselves to do analysis automatically of high rise pictures to figure out how traversable this terrain is. Once again, James Canvin comes to the fore. And green is nice and easy parking lot, red has got some nasty sand dunes in it. You can go back and correlate how well he ranks this as for drivability back in kind of rover history and it ties in superbly. And so the rover drivers are currently picking their way through this sort of stuff up here, avoiding the worst of the sand dunes, finding the parking lot type driving terrain. Once the rover's back out here, it'll be foot to the floor, and Endurance Crater will be here sooner than we think. Midnight Mars Browser is kind of the ultimate bringing together of all the different abilities and all the imagery we can get a hold of. It's a piece of software that you can download from Mac or PC, completely free. And it's written by a guy called Michael Howard. He's a programmer in the States. And I felt kind of left out of it and have my own sort of block diagram. So here we go. Midnight Mars Browser, you, you install it in your machine, you say update. And what it will do is grab the most recent images from Spirit and Opportunity. And if they're at the JPL website first, it'll get it from there first. If they're at the Exploratorium, it'll get them there first. Once it's got all those raw JPEGs, it knows what that JPEG is about based on the file name, when it was taken, what filter it was taken with, which camera in a stereo pair it was taken with. And so it'll go away and automatically generate its best false color and its best stereo anaglyph for every single observation, the whole lot, all of them. Cornell University, who are the lead scientists for the Mars Exploration Rovers, maintain a database that has loca the rover location, rover orientation, anytime any image is taken. And we don't want to hammer this thing directly, so what Mike does is ping the database for the information he needs, turns it into an XML file we host on his own web space, and then the next time you hit command and update, you get the rover location and the pointing information for all the images he downloaded the day before. 
And as a result, he can now reproject those images back into 3D space. And so you see Mars from the rover's eye view. Six months later, Dan Crotty comes along with his 16,000 calibrated PanCam observations. And they feed forward into Midnight Mars Browser as well, replacing the false color pictures generated on the day-by-day -day basis. And if you really want to fill your hard drive, and I have, you can download the PDS data that's the calibrated data. And the, the, the point of that is to get the pan cam images when they haven't taken a color image or the wider navigation camera black and white data so the things mosaic perfectly and they're all calibrated to one another. It all strings together in an application like this. I, I'll be leaving about five. If you want to hunt me down and have a play with this, please do. It's an absolutely brilliant piece of software. You can say, I want to see, in this case, let's see panoramas by opportunity. You could say, I want to see the left hazard avoidance camera, full frames only, from opportunity from Sol's 122 to 463, and then just click your way through the whole lot and watch what the rover's been doing. To give you an example, I've said I want to see a panorama from opportunity on about Sol 330-ish. In fact, this is the location of that artist impression that one guy did with the opportunity's hot ride. This is a chunk of abandoned heat shield, so is this, and the, this is actually Endurance Crater, about 200 meters across, a couple of hundred meters away. This is the calibrated PDS navcam data. We can chuck the uncalibrated JPEGs from PanCam straight over the top in situ, where they should be on top of the feature that they're looking at, because we have this pointing information. Six months later, Dan comes along, calibrated color picture. And because we know where the rover has been every time it takes a picture, we can introduce a route map over the top of it. And because I can wield 3DS Max like the next man, a 3D rover to go in situ as well. So you can do one of two things. You can sit on the rover and ride along from mosaic to mosaic with the images being reprojected into accurate 3D space. Or you can stand in one rover situation and watch the rover moving around. It's not smooth. It's not articulated. It's not as good as it could be if we had every ounce of data coming out of JPL. But for that four-letter word that Scott mentioned earlier, it begins with an I, that's not going to happen. So this is the best we can do without it. Going for the kind of ride the rover view, this is actually the rim of Victoria Crater. You can see rover tracks here. This is the rover taking images of its own tracks to measure how quickly it's leaving, to actually measure kind of visual odometry of the ground. And so you can see it's reprojecting it back into 3D space. And so the rover's wobbling around a bit. We actually get to see the rim driving away. And if you're wondering what this is called, it's called the Drunken Sailor Drive, because the train here is so featureless that it hasn't got anything to actually stereo interpolate. So by wiggling the wheels as it went, it gave it something to actually watch as it drove to measure its own progress. Jump into the third person view. And this is uh, Dan's calibrated pan cam imagery from the summit of Husband Hill. If you're wondering what this is here, the green, the red, and the blue, that's a dust devil that was screaming past as the red, the green, and the blue images were actually taken as they've taken one after the other. And the rover's ability to kind of follow its own tracks, as it were, is uncanny in some of these situations. Um, Given how jerry-rigged together this is, I'm amazed it works. Um, for texturing of this little 3D model, what's quite funny is that the, uh, the warm electronics box, the gold kind of bus of this thing, I found pictures from the Kennedy Space Center website. The best image I could find of the solar panels is actually Spirit's self-portrait from a couple of years ago. I couldn't find better pictures of the solar panels than the one the rovers have taken themselves. Media. What, are, what else do these, these kind of fellow nutters do? This is a mosaic taken by Spirit. It was, in fact, an accident, this mosaic. But um, one guy put together a rough version of this. And then three of us collaborated and stitched it together. And in some cases, cheated a bit. Uh, there are two rows of images here. And actually, this low gain antenna should have been completely ripped, but cut it out, moved it, matched it, filled it in with pictures from the other eye to get one kind of continuous, nice, arty impression of the summit of Husband Hill. Craig Cavolt from Aviation Week magazine says, I love it. I'm going to put it on the cover of Aviation Week magazine. So he did. And then so did the British Interplanetary Society, so did a science supplement in a Belgian newspaper, and new scientists called it one of their images of the year in 2005. And quoting, uh, they cited uh, one of the three people who made it, a guy called Marco De Lorenzo, and we classified it as Marco De Lorenzo et al. And they said Marco De Lorenzo et al. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been on the strongly picture of the day in all sorts of places. I'm kind of getting sick of the sight of the image myself because I can see where I've screwed up and there are little mistakes. But it's... It's an it's instance whereby, yeah, if they really wanted an image from JPL, there might have been a mosaic. It might have been black and white. It may have been color. Perhaps not quite as visually dramatic as this was. So just maybe a science mission made at the cover of Aviation Week magazine that wouldn't have done had it not been for us amateurs chucking together the pictures that we do. 
Because there's 2,000 people watching what these rovers do, they know what the rovers are capable of, they recognize the features that they've seen, and they know how to go and find out what they've been up to. As a result, when you get a science story on a new scientist's website saying that scientists have found puddles on the surface of Mars, you go, well, hold on, we, we know that that's not the right color because Dan produces our calibrated JPEGs for us. But So where was that picture? It should be this color. So it's not bright blue and a bright puddle. But where is it? Well, in Midnight Mars Browser, we can see where the image is. In fact, that picture belongs here. It's on the surface of a cliff. So <laughs> for a puddle on the surface of Mars, it's the wrong color, and it's like this. And quite quickly, new scientists saw the, the reaction that we'd had, bold as it was. And the researchers have retracted their claim. Yeah, they, they backed out pretty quickly once they realized what they were actually looking at. They hadn't seen the images in context. They hadn't thought about this is just one picture, what does it actually mean in the context of all the other pictures taken. You may have seen this guy about a year or so ago, the sedimentary Sasquatch, the basaltic uh, yeti, this tiny thing here. Um, one Japanese website, I think, picked up on this mosaic about four or five months after it was taken and said, it's a yeti, it's a yeti on Mars. And well, we've seen those pictures. We know how far apart the cameras are. We know the toe-in of the stereo pair. We know the resolution of the cameras. Basic trigonometry, we figured out how far away it is. Once you figured out how far away it is, you can figure out how big it is. This Yeti is about the size of a packet of cigarettes. <laughs> and to prove the point of pareidolia, this, this ability of the human brain to pick out something human or anomalistic in almost any image, one guy took the same mosaic from which you'll find this tiny little rock and found every single slightly strange formation that there is, including my personal favorite, the high-speed turtle. <laughs> <laughs> and what the JPL Public Affairs Office do is if the media say, oh, you know, this looks like a whatever, this looks like something, this looks like something, they'll send them these pictures and say, yeah, if you really want it to, everything will look like something else. I love the little duck there. He looks like a mallard. He's got a white neck and everything. <laughs> now, Back in the 60s and 70s and the 80s and the early 90s, we didn't have the internet to make this happen. But we also didn't have the will of the scientists to make this happen. And a lot of people, when they heard that Steve and Jim were going to chuck their pictures straight on the web, they're going, you're giving away your data. What are you doing? This is feedback. Uh, this is talking about why these pictures are online. It's exactly so people could do what you're doing, follow along, share the ride, enjoy the adventure at whatever level you wanted to, whether it's click and look at the pictures or go off and try to do something of substance with them. So I've seen it work out the way it has, I'm just thrilled. Frequently I'll get up in the morning and the first place I go is I'm at spaceflight because I know I'm going to get the mosaics there rather than raw images if I go through all the firewalls to the JPL website because nobody in Pasadena has even woken up yet. I did it this morning to see how our drive went. This is Steve Squires, the principal investigator of the Mars Exploration Rovers. I was able to tell Steve that his drive went brilliantly, thank you very much, <laughs> because the drive happened, the images were taken, they were downlinked, someone produced the wide angle mosaic, someone produced the next drive direction mosaic, and somebody put another pin in the map. So that within hours of the drive happening, amateurs have kind of made every little piece of information that can be extrapolated from all the data available publicly consumable. Where MER has led, other missions have followed, some more reluctantly than others. This is the Cassini mission, the multi-billion dollar spacecraft orbiting Saturn, and it chucks its raw images online as quickly as spirit and opportunity do. And so people produce, in this instance, this is a series of color images showing one of the icy moons rising above the limb of Saturn. I'm kind of more of a Mars guy than a Saturn guy, so I don't know which moon this is. Here's another mosaic. It's a couple of frames from Cassini. I'd urge you to actually, if you've never looked at this sort of stuff before, go and look at the Cassini pictures over the next few months, because Cassini's shifting seasons and the ring plane, the kind of the, the orientation of the rings is now almost directly in line with the sun. So the shadow being cast by the rings is currently absolutely minuscule. And in a few months' time, it's going to flip. So the illumination is going to go away and come back on the other side. And what we've been able to find, people trawling through all these pictures, is the little moonlets and the little waves and the little disturbances in the ring plane. These rings are only a couple of hundred meters thick. We're actually seeing shadows cast across the rings by the morphology of the rings themselves. It's absolutely fascinating. The moons of uh, Saturn actually stitch together almost better than chunks of Mars do because the images tend to be kind of stretched just enough for us to drag it back to normality. This is a, just a little mosaic put together by Emily Lackdweller of Iapetus, the kind of giant cosmic walnut. And 
Calibration, we do that with these pictures as well. The guy has written a script called IMG to PNG that will take the calibrated PDS files, just run it through a little uh, a batch file in, in uh, XP or Win, uh, Vista or whatever you want to do. It will take all the calibrated files, reference the folder of calibration information for Cassini, and spit out calibrated PNGs in 12 bits for all the images. And any monkey with Photoshop can figure out what to do with a PNG. So this guy's gone through and produced calibrated images of every single major moon of Saturn. And they're not just calibrated to one, sorry, in, the, in and of themselves. This sequence of images is calibrated in size and in relative brightness. So Enceladus here is the brightest body in the entire solar system. And we'll scroll along. One of the moons almost vanishes. That's Iapetus, almost the darkest body in the solar system. That's Hyperion. And this is Titan, which actually, relative to the other moons, is a pretty murky dull, dark sort of place. In fact, Iapetus is caked in bright, shiny ice. Kind of makes it stand out like a beacon. Same guy who's produced IMG to PNG. He's also done work with Cassini images, knowing where Cassini is based on published spice kernels, knowing the resolution of the camera, etc., etc. He's interpolated multiple observations of this giant crater on uh, Mimas, and has produced an elevation model. And he's actually now producing, very, very slowly, he, you know, he's doing the best he can with the time and the abilities he has. He's producing global elevation models of Saturnian satellites based on imagery put online purely on an amateur basis. It's, it's um, I, I, I haven't got a clue how you do this, but he's done it. Phoenix did exactly the same thing. In fact, Phoenix took it up just one notch slightly above the rovers. Uh, Phoenix kind of suffered a bit by being short-lived and not having wheels, so it wasn't quite as exciting to follow along as one of the rovers trundling around. But what they did was put the pointing information, the timing information, in an EXIF header in all of the JPEGs. So if Phoenix had been lasting a little bit longer, we could have tweaked Midnight Mars Browser, so it didn't even have to go and reference this database of, of uh, Cornell. It would just know the information straight in the EXIF headers. And James Camvent, he put mosaics together from Phoenix data as well. What was extraordinary is that I was watching an interview on the sky at night, not long after Phoenix landed. And it was an interview with one of the, uh, the meteorology scientists in the, their big, massive science planning room. And right in the background, behind these guys' heads, I could see on like, like, about as far away as the back of this room, I could see a huge printout of a Phoenix mosaic. And I thought, I recognize that mosaic. That's not a Phoenix outreach mosaic. That's James's mosaic. And I double-checked and screen-grabbed the TV and compared it with James's mosaic, and in fact, they had. They'd seen James's mosaic, thought, that's damn good. We're printing that out, and we're sticking it on our wall. Ultimate testament, in some respects, to the, the payback for chucking those pictures out there is that the public are making images good enough that the scientists would want to put them on their own wall. Enough pairs of eyes will see anything change. This was the kind of key kind of wow moment for the Phoenix mission, in many respects. This is the same trench dug by this arm on, uh, on cons uh, days, four days apart. And you can see little white chunks here. That's not a lighting effect. They actually do vanish. That's chunks of ice that have sublimated away. And two people almost simultaneously on the forum said, look, the, 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 here's the pictures from Monday. Here's the pictures from Friday. The ice is gone. And suddenly, you know, the, the Phoenix mission had found the ice it went looking for. And by putting the pictures out there, we'd figured it out for ourselves before they got the press releases out there. Ed and Fergus talked yesterday about the exceptionally cool stuff they did with high-altitude balloons. Um, I essentially stalked them for a number of months because I thought it was just so damn cool. And uh, James Cox, a friend of theirs, who, who also does this sort of thing himself, um, I was maybe a little bit critical of the pictures he'd taken because they weren't that good. So I said, he, he said, well, if you think you can do better, go on. So. Here's James's science payload. I put together a, a camera from a, a PowerShot camera using uh, hacked firmware. Some people on the forum figured out the orientation to have the camera to get the best chance of mosaics to get beautiful views. And we had it taking movies like this up at high altitude. And uh, it basically went movie, pause, still, 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 pause, movie, pause. And it was taking movies about one quarter of the time. So we had a 25% chance of catching the balloon bursting, which we almost did a 25% chance of catching the landing, which we did. And then a couple of days later, these guys say, we're doing another flight. And I'm at work trying to get my job done to avoid getting fired. <laughs> and I say, fantastic, when? Tomorrow morning. I've got to go to work. Well, really early tomorrow morning. How about 4 AM? And so, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, what we learned with that first flight was that 
the best mosaics came from taking the movies themselves and actually pulling the frames out to make a mosaic from the individual frames of a movie. So this is showing the kind of sinusoidal swinging of the gondola at 30 some odd kilometers altitude. This is one of the high res uh, individual frames. I don't know if you can see the kind of the, uh, the little extra toy in there. That is the moon just rising over the limb. And James, Can uh, James Canvin took all of our frames and individual movie frames and produced our very own very, very low altitude blue marble. And uh, I love this image. It's fantastic. So yeah, these guys say, well, we're going to launch again tomorrow morning. So I rejig the whole camera, make another housing, kind of like some sort of steampunk bird box, and realize that if I took movies and turned the whole thing into portrait mode, I could make better mosaics. And so working through the night and then driving to Cambridge, we bolted this thing on. This is one of the movies it took. This is what, about half five in the morning, somewhere over Stansted Airport. You can actually see the shadow of the Earth there. And again, a 25% chance they showed you the movie yesterday that actually caught the balloon bursting. And here's James's mosaic from altitude of the whole of the southeastern UK at five in the morning. It's not quite, not quite space flight, but it's the closest we've got off our own bat so far. Then one day, a guy came onto the forum, John Spencer. He's a Cassini scientist, and he's on the science team for the New Horizons spacecraft. Now, the New Horizons spacecraft is the first mission to the object formerly known as a planet, currently known as Pluto. And to get to Pluto, it needed to do a, swing, a slingshot past Jupiter to get a kick out to the outer solar system. And as they flew past Jupiter, New Horizons' dirty secret is it took more science data at Jupiter than it will do at Pluto, because the flyby was slightly more slow, and they had a chance to downlink and have much better data rates at Jovian distances rather than Pluto distances. And they planned the science sequences they wanted to take, but they realized they had an opportunity to take some pictures that were just amazing. But they didn't really have the time to figure out when they'd be. So John came onto the forum and said, if you find a specific time when you think we should press the shutter, let us know. <laughs> oh, oh boy, did we let him know. <laughs> uh, to, the, to, the, to the guy's credit, um, he, he said, here's a tool to see the New Horizons trajectory, and you, here's the resolution and abilities of all the cameras, and here's their field of view, et cetera, et cetera. And one guy in particular, Richard Hendricks, he went away, figured out the ephemeris data for the moons, figured out when the moons would be rising and setting, when they'd be conjuncting with one another, and made about four suggestions, which all got included. Here's a kind of uh, a simulated view of Europa rising behind Jupiter, and Io and Europa juxtaposed against one another. What we didn't know when we suggested these is that Io would be on show in a way that we couldn't possibly have imagined. Here's Europa. That's the picture they took. And that's Io, doing what Io does best. It's a volcano called Thrashtar. And in fact, they have a few frames. You can actually see this volcano. You actually see the ejector moving over time. What was really, really nice about this particular image is that they didn't just take a high-resolution black and white camera image. They also took the moderate-resolution color data as well. And so John came to us and said, when should we take the shutter? When, the, when are we going to see these cool pictures? And someone said, well, this will be a really cool opportunity. And so they took the pictures. They chucked the data on the web. And then someone went and put the black and white data and the medium-resolution color data together, and we produced this image as a result. And so it's the complete circle. When do we take the pictures? This is good. We'll take them, here's the data, and we've done the best we can with it. And these two observations, I think, in my opinion, are the key images from that entire flyby. They're the ones that get repeated in the press and so on and so forth. There is a problem, however. You may have noticed I've been talking about projects that can be classified as west of here. This is all American stuff, essentially. And there are some ESA people here, and I don't wish to offend. But ESA doesn't do this. Not yet, anyway. Not enough. The best example I can come up with is the Rosetta spacecraft. This is a one billion euro spacecraft, European project. It's going to fly all the way to a comet whose name I will dare to pronounce on the web feed, Churmyov Gerasimenko. If you can do better, <laughs> I'll give you a fiver. Uh, it's a, it's a, a kind of a 10 year journey to get to this, this comet. And Rosetta is actually going to land, it's going to deploy a lander and land on a comet. It's an extraordinary mission, and yet not that many people in Europe even know it exists. 
To get to this comet, it's had to do several Earth flybys and a Mars flyby. And you can imagine, well, the, the, one of the cameras on Rosetta is this four megapixel camera. It's absolutely stunning piece of engineering. Had they come to us like John Spencer did and said, we're doing this flyby of Mars, here's the trajectory, when should we take pictures because they're going to look cool? We'd have got some fantastic suggestions because the departing leg of this flyby had a beautiful crescent Mars. They didn't think to ask. This is my artist's impression of what it might have been like. Very few people in Europe know about Rosetta. Had they taken an image like this and it made the front or the second page of national newspapers, perhaps a few more people might know that we have a billion euro mission flying to a comet right now. And that's just at a, a kind of an interactive level. Even just chucking their data out there, Europe doesn't get this yet. This is a screenshot of the Rosetta page on the Planetary Data Service, the small bodies node, because it's going to a comet, so it's the small bodies node of the PDS. And this is the list of every instrument that's on Rosetta and all the instruments on the Rosetta lander. This section here is enlarged because it's got lots more links on it. And this is my best list of all the horrific acronyms for most of the instruments on board Rosetta. Some of the instruments on Rosetta haven't, weren't used in these Earth flybys and this Mars flyby, these commissioning and calibration and checkout phases. And what's unique about these things is they take cool pictures, and they have put a few of them online. One image of Mars coming in full on, but to be honest, it didn't look that different to a Hubble picture or the odd picture of the Earth flyby, but where's the rest of it? Let's look at the, the nationalities of these uh, instruments. Uh, European, American. Alice is run by Alan Stern over in the States. You want to know which instruments have chucked all their data online? Have a bit of a guess. A couple of them. It's just Alice. Uh, Osiris is the amazing high resolution camera. Images of multiple Earth flybys and the Mars flyby, nothing. The, uh, there's a camera on board the Rosetta Lander. That's uh, this instrument here. And during the Mars flyby, it took, I know, six images of Mars as it flew past. And they've released one of them. It's a stunning view, because the lander is still bolted to Rosetta. It's looking out sideways across the spacecraft. You've got Mars below you and one of Rosetta's solar panels sticking out. It's an extraordinary picture. Where are the other five? But to their credit, the engineers within ESA are beginning to get this. And when I heard news about this, I almost let out a girly scream. This Crummy little camera called the VMC, a visual monitoring camera, is on board Mars Express. Here are the specs. Its purpose was to image Beagle 2 as it left Mars Express to make sure it had left, to make sure it was going in the right direction. And for four years, nearly, it's been turned off. And perhaps frustrated by scientists not pulling their education and outreach weight, the Mars Express engineers said, maybe we can turn it back on again. Now, you can see it's not the best piece of kit, but it's been taking pictures for about 12 months now. They've been putting pictures straight back on the web. They call it the first Mars webcam. <laughs> but there was a qualifier. It was, here's the, here's the imagery, but it's the Bayer pattern filter CCD, but we don't have the time to write a piece of software to interpolate it. But here's the raw data. Here's some just chucked out PNGs. And here's a Celestia file, so you know where Mars Express was when we took these pictures. Within 24 hours of that first chunk of data being released, two people independently had written DOS prompt scripts to take that data and produce color pictures like this. And the ESOC guys say, if you can do something cool with these pictures, send them back in, we'll chuck them on our website. And that's exactly what they do. These aren't the greatest science pictures ever taken of Mars. These are very unique global views of the planet. Cracking mosaic here. And this is an animation of multiple frames. This is a cloud dispersing after sunrise. And this picture got sent back to the ESOC guys. The ESOC guys said, that's interesting. They took it through and showed some scientists. And the scientists went, that is interesting. And suddenly, they're getting inspired to maybe go and look at what we found for them. And some of the processing people are doing with these pictures is extraordinary. And they're putting the pictures back on the ESA website from this Mars webcam. So perhaps it's fair to say ESA doesn't do this enough. But the really heartbreaking thing is that I can prove they're not doing it enough. A science paper published about 18 months ago, a pilot survey of attitudes to space sciences and exploration among British school children. Here are the authors. They interviewed about 200 kids in eight schools in the east of England, and they asked them a couple of questions. This was the third question they asked them. Can you name any organization from anywhere in the world that carries out space research? Top answer? 
NASA. Number two answer, don't know. Number three, Russian. Here's the results. ESA barely registered. This survey was done six months after the landing of Beagle 2 and shortly after the landing of Huygens on Titan, and school kids didn't have a clue. This is from the paper. ESA had one more response than Area 51 and two more responses than Men in Black. The British National Space Centre was not mentioned once. <laughs> Another question they asked, and this is not five, six, seven-year-olds. This is 13 to 15-year-old kids. What do you imagine conditions would be like on the surface of Mars? Now, bearing in mind, Mars is typically, on average, surface temperature 50, 60, 70, 80 degrees Celsius colder than Earth. Top answer, hot. So we have a problem in that the kids around here have no idea what's going on up there. And to give you an example of just how bad this is, Science and Technology Facilities Council do a funding project for education and outreach projects called Science and Society. The small grants project up to £15,000 for interesting and unique science outreach projects. Typically, they're funding 10 to 15 projects every six months to a tune of about 70 to 100,000 pounds in total. First half of 2009, they've only funded seven projects and they've cut a 50% cut on that funding. It's the lowest number of projects ever funded, the smallest amount of money ever funded in the Science and Society small, uh, small projects budget. So the truth is, if kids don't know what's going up there and the government isn't really paying to help, then it's up to us. And what has made me so very happy coming to my first AMSAT colloquium is just how many projects talk about education and outreach. I think you can all be very proud of yourselves for doing what the professional people aren't really doing enough. Thank you very much indeed. We are behind.